Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all and welcome to everyone who's joining us online through the webinar as well. Um, I'm Jam Tyree. I'm Distinguished Visiting Professor, the cinema program here at VCU Arts. Thanks to VCU Arts and ICA for hosting us. It's my honor, my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to this VCU Arts faculty lecture event featuring my cinema program colleague and friend, Professor Yosera Bushtia and her short film, Afri, The Coming Night. I will introduce Yosera and we'll take time to watch this wonderful film together. I think it's about 10 minutes in, long in total. Um, and then Yosera will speak after me a little bit about the film and we'll reconvene for a discussion afterwards with the filmmaker. So I'd like you to do, think about questions you have while you're watching. There'll be roving mics here live and use the Q&A function on the webinar and Zoom to submit questions to us uh, for after the screening. So um, Yosera Bushtia, a Moroccan American screenwriter, director, whose work is committed to shedding light on hidden truths within underrepresented communities while bridging the gap between the Eastern and Western worlds. Yosera received her MFA in film directing from Columbia University, um, and she earned her BS in psychology and a BA in cinema from none other than Virginia Commonwealth University VCU Arts right here. And her work has been screened at Sundance, Salento International Film Festival, LA Short Fest, Flickers Rhode Island International Film Festival, the Women's International Film Festival in Saleh, Morocco as well. Um, and about the film, in addition to that very impressive resume, um, Afri is titled after the Amazia, I'm going to mispronounce with apologies, uh, Amazia goddess uh, who provides protection and sustenance over her children. It's a stunningly filmed movie, glorious black and white. Uh, extraordinary interweaving of form and content to reveal the interconnected lives and landscapes of Morocco. The lives of children, women in particular here are foregrounded through the use of non-professional actors to achieve fidelity to lived experience and its flow. Uh, we'll see violence here, physical, verbal, combined with compassionate, lyrical meditations on lived environments, natural places inhabited by the complexities of everyday necessity, as well as more cosmic yearnings, spirituality, all under the overarching power of natural forces beyond human control. A neo-realist handheld camera sensibility, you'll see here, filming people, faces, profiles, and it's combined wonderfully well with still contemplative images of sublime uh, emptiness, which is also a fullness, I think, of light and shadow of the great desert. In the poem, Auguries of Innocence, the English poet William Blake says to seek the universe, in a grain of sand. Afri, I think, finds transcendence in images of motes of dust, the fading light of the arid west over distant mountains, the human form silhouetted against this vast backdrop. It contains poetic and yet maybe even ominous images that fuse the individual with the mythic and the focus here is on two characters, brother and sister, Udad and Khenen, um, brother and sister who seek out one another as an almost otherworldly darkness starts to descend over their world. And all of these natural mysteries, human enigmas, I think they really ask us to consider how these images and places and people might possibly be connected. And we leave, I think, with a sense that there's more to unfold of this story. And I'll turn it over to you, Yosera. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Josh. And thank you guys for being here. Um, this is the second screening of the film. So all of you are actually very early audiences. So it's really exciting for me to share this with you all. And it's also a film that took several years to complete. 
Um, the way I approached it was almost in a documentarian style with a very skeletal script. And um, from there, I really, you know, collaborated with my DP and my crew members. And we ended up shooting about eight hours of footage. So what you see in front of you or what you will see these 10 minutes took a lot to edit. So I'm really happy to share this. And um, I'm also excited for the Q&A. So thank you so much. Thank you for that beautiful film. <laughs> I love seeing it again. The dust motes, just really moving. Thank images. you. I'm sure you have lots of questions for you, Sarah. I know we have probably have some questions from the webinar Q and A, but before we get to that, while you're thinking that over, I was wondering if maybe you would like to talk about Afri, um, the cultural context, maybe even the location. Really interesting stuff about the people you worked with in the production. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Afri is an African deity. And um, this film was filmed on location in Wurzazet, Morocco. So Wurzazet is also known as the Gates to the Desert. It's about three hours south of Marrakesh. And um, Afri is this deity that has been there pre-Islam for thousands of years. And really, it's, it's how Africa got its name when the first you know um, europeans came across they discovered that many of the indigenous people were worshiping this feminine deity so i wanted to honor that and really just go back and and reclaim her essence because i think history has buried her in so many ways so it's a tribute to that and also to the people to um in Wurzazet and the emazir people and about this town, it has a really interesting connection to cinema. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, Wurzazet um, is also known as the Hollywood of Africa. There's a, a big studio there. Um, a lot of you know films and television shows go through there. So the family I worked with, you know, they were non-actors. However, a lot of them has, have been extras in, in films from as early as Black Hawk Down to you know, Game of Thrones. So um, they were very comfortable with the camera um, and the town itself was very friendly to us shooting there. Although our style was totally different. You know, it was um, like you said, we were playing with, with realism in a poetic way. So, so yeah, it was kind of an interesting dynamic just to see the studio system um, present there versus, you know, what we were creating. And the buildings, they, <laughs> they have an interesting story behind them as well, right? Yeah, so uh, the buildings were an abandoned club med from, I was told, from the 80s. <laughs> so we were trying to shoot around, you know, the pools and to make it look you know not like it was a, a a tiki bar things like that so uh it was interesting um but yeah that's kind of the history of it <laughs> uh perhaps some questions from the audience thank you i see a few hands up um i was wondering if the like since the movie is like i guess the film is subtitled does that sort of like translation is there anything that gets like lost in that like is there like a barrier that, that the language kind of can't express yeah i mean that's a good question i think with any language things get in you know lost in translation um so what they're speaking is is amazia um, Morocco, you know, uh, the official languages are French, Arabic, and, and Amazigh. Um, I personally do not speak Amazigh, so I actually had, you know, I mean, luckily they, they spoke to me in Arabic, so we were able to, you know, work together, but I had people on set who were helping me translate my dialogue that I wanted them to say, and so still it was, it was kind of a challenge, um, but you know, I think that's kind of the beauty of it because 
even still, you know, translating the story to to screen, I had a I had a hard time with that, just the poetic um, elements that I wanted to play with and the messages behind it. But I think a lot of it is universal. So um, hopefully, you know, it spoke to you. Um, hi. So something that I was noticing as I was watching it and then afterwards when you said that the location was kind of like a transition to the mountains and like the fact that the children were the focus of the film, um, was climate change something that you were thinking about at all while making it? Like how the kids are the ones that have to like stay out in the night alone? That's just something I was Yeah. Um, oh, I was not thinking that, but I think that's a beautiful interpretation. <laughs> You know, I think anytime we look at Earth and just the forces of nature, we always, at least personally, I always think of this feminine energy. So it is about, you know, going back to this need to nurture where we came from and respect where we came from. Um, so I, I think you can, you know, draw a lot of interpretations from that. But essentially, there is this feminine energy in Henan, the sister who goes looking out for her brother that she's tapping into and that she's challenging, you know, and so that's what she's um, emanating in the end. I see a couple of more hands up. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about how um, a lot of times like more feminine aspects are seen as like passive and um i noticed like when they were inside she kind of like went i would presume her mother or some sort of like elder figure she kind of like allowed the mom to direct how she treated her brother mm -hmm. or um but then when she and like also i noticed that at least for me, like when she was in contained spaces inside, she seemed much more like subordinate. Um, like when she went down into the cave, she had a moment where she seemed like she would just stay there. And like when she decided to go back up, that's when the energy was kind of like freeing and she was able to assert herself. Um, and I was wondering like how you decided to like play with the different moments of like assertiveness and passivity within how you portrayed her in the film yeah i think that's a really interesting read um i think there's a gentleness to her character um and then there's a moment when she's in the cave where she realizes she has to do something out of her compassion so that's the moment that compels her to go out looking for her brother so again it's because I'm playing with this mythology of, you know, there's two suns in the sky and they're going to set for the first time in a long time. And they're afraid. They're afraid of what that means to them. But through that, she's able to find the courage out of her love for her brother to bypass that and go look for him. So again, it, it just stems from this need to, to, you know, do something out of love. So, and that's, that's how she's portrayed. Um, hello. First of all, I just wanted to say that being your student right now, getting to see your work is really, really cool. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and my question was, uh, in the film, you can tell that the sister and the brother have a close relationship they do care for each other he goes to her for help and when he is in need and i think with how uh not with the length of the film i feel like that would be it it was well portrayed how um just of a balance the the dynamic between both of the siblings so i was just wondering was it hard to have to cut down those eight hours and have to decide how to better, how to portray that dynamic so perfectly, I guess? Yes, it was, <laughs> it was very hard. Um, because I had 
just like an outline to work with. You know, there were moments when I thought, oh, no, this is Uded's story, the brother. And then there were other moments where I thought, no, this is Hanan's story. And so, you know, through editing, I really realized that it's a dual protagonist, you know, and they kind of switch off in the middle there. Um, but that was because I was kind of working just surely through improvised, um, you know, scenes. So it was really challenging. I mean, going through those eight hours of footage, I had to kill a lot of darlings and it was not easy. Um, but ultimately I, I feel like it came down to what was the essence and how can I portray that with what I have? So that's what I, I got in these 10 minutes. In that specific sense, are you starting with the image, the most resonant image, or are you starting with the idea in terms of your creative process? Uh, which direction do you like to go in with that particular pol polarity in your art? Yeah, um, because, you know, at the end of the day, I always feel like story is king in a lot of ways. And so I always have to make sure the scene has a turning point and, you know, the scene has a, a specific point of view. And so it was challenging for me because while I wanted the images to speak for themselves, I knew that I needed something emotional through the characters, through the writing. So the writing came through the editing. So it was a constant back and forth through it, and, and which is why it took a long time for me to finish this. But um, I would say, yeah, it was a, it was a balance I had to strike. And how do you strike that balance of sort of not over explaining? If, if is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, um, you know, I it's tough, right? I, how do you not over explain, and how do you not feed the audience too much, but also get them engaged and get them intrigued and get them interpreting? Um, but you know, this is, I'm still pretty early in terms of my screening, so I'm really excited to see how audiences are, are responding to it. Um, I think I tend to over explain. So this is, you know, this is kind of new for me to kind of step back a little bit and let the audience trust in the images and the story. We do get a bit of information like the lady in of darkness i think it's is that the right line the lady in the darkness yes, the lady in the darkness yes yeah so i you know th that's referring to afri and um her fierce presence and, and her fierce side that she has um and you know it, it's really the men that are afraid of of that um so so yeah you know i i think Really, this this is the beginning to a feature length that um, I, I plan to continue. Um, That's wonderful news. Yeah, and to really just dig deeper into this mythology, into the specificity of you know um, what is Azat and and the different rituals and even the occult presence and things like that. So um, it's just the beginning. <laughs> Very exciting. I believe we have some more questions. Thank you. So let's, uh, we have a couple questions on the online uh, forum. I think you actually answered a couple of these already, um, but if, if you want to elaborate, we had a question about your story planning process um, and like the writing process, um, and also a question about the decision to film AFRI as a short rather than a feature. Um, to start with. So if you want to elaborate on either of those a little bit more. Yeah, so um, I started this project as a graduate student and um, the story um, came from, you know, a classmate of mine and we were both inspired by Isaac Isimov's short story Nightfall, which is a science fiction piece and it plays with this, you know, this premise that there's three suns or multiple suns in the sky and the first first time in a long time they set and suddenly you know the people have to do something about that and so i wanted to play off of that but also be in morocco <laughs> shoot it in morocco but the reason i shot it in black and white is because i didn't want the colors of morocco to suddenly bring back images of 
of what many people think Morocco is and, and know Morocco to be. So I'm still kind of a little bit dabbling into the sci-fi. Um, but once I went to Morocco, you know, the actor I was going to hire just kind of all those plans went out the door because suddenly I thought, oh, my gosh, I need to really dig deep into this landscape and look at the people here and see what I can nurture out of this, you know, situation. Um, and so a story evolved out of that. And um, again, I, I just had like a four page very rough outline of scenes that I wanted. But then as we were shooting, you know, there were moments, very mundane moments that suddenly I was like, oh, this is really interesting. You know, the, the moment where they're soaking the sun into their skin, like all of that was just um, me just observing what they were doing and I wanted to play off of that. Um, so it was really collaborative in that way. And of course it ended up being eight hours of footage um so the editing process took a you know a few years to complete um but yeah i mean i think now in hindsight i i know precisely what i'm gonna look for in terms of the feature and um it really does stem from this again afri and and her presence that's still there it's quite a big um can I call it a risk or a, a wager to operate that way for the material to come emerge out of the situation itself? It's very exciting and you can feel that in the film as well. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's uh, again, like I'm pretty methodical and I prepare everything in terms of shots, but this was very new because, you know, it was also really, you know, exciting because it was suddenly very spontaneous. But it made me really aware of, of the present and what I was seeing, and it made me really observant. Um, you know, obviously, I think with any documentaries, the editing always takes up so much time. So I think it kind of had that same process. Um, but the risk definitely outweighs, you know, it was worth it in the end. Did that allow the, the players, the actors to actively, creatively collaborate as well in that case? You know, um, the, the moments with the children, again, that was totally improvised. I was just telling them, go play, you know, here's some marbles. Let's see what you guys come up with. And they were just so excited, you know, that the camera was rolling. And so we started filming their shadows and what that meant, for, you know, for the storyline. So yeah, they had a huge role in, in the story and even in the scenes and the turning points in the scenes. And combining that with genre fiction works so beautifully. It's yeah. like such an interesting polarity. It is. <laughs> I, I did see uh, uh, at least one other hand up. Thank you. Thank you. So hello, can you hear me? Hello. <laughs> so I have a few questions. I hope you don't mind. So my first one relates to the silhouette of the sister's headscarf. It seems to be like a very present motif throughout the film because we constantly kind of see it. And it's honestly very striking, very beautiful shadow silhouette. But how did you, did you like consciously decide to put her in a headscarf in that specific style to emulate Afri in any way, or is that just like what she came to set on with that day? Yeah, that's that's a scarf she always wears at home, you know, so there was nothing in terms of my decision that was like inherent. I was just kind of working with with her as and who she was and what she brought to her own character. Uh, but it, it's interesting that you bring that up because, yeah, it, it is striking visually, especially in the black and white. And then my other, I have like one more question after this. Um, the music is really, it's kind of like a central part, at least for me, because I'm a very music oriented filmmaker. Um, so how did you decide on those pieces where they composed or did you find them and you're like, wow. Um, it's, it's a well known composer, actually. Um, and, um, you know, it was actually through a film that I, 
I, I was watching and I came across it. And because I was still a student, I was able to utilize it. Um, but I don't know if you if you know the uh, film Babel, but it's it's from that soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I'm in my last question, so I stopped hogging the mic. Um, how does the production process change? Because I am also of like immigrant background, and I also want to kind of go back to the motherland, quote unquote and film there. So how does the how does the filmmaking process differ in Morocco? Is there a different process? Did you like interact with locals? I know you mentioned that you interacted with a lot of actors, but did you was your crew also locals? Yes. Um with the exception of my producer who was American and my cinematographer who was Italian. Everyone else was Moroccan. Um you know, I, I go back to Morocco almost every year, so I still have roots there. But still, despite that, I'm always seen as the American. Um, so, you know, I think sometimes I have to check myself in terms of what kind of lens am I looking at these stories that I want to tell in Morocco? And, um, you know, am I exotifying anything or am I viewing them through a Western gaze? um so you know it's it's challenging but i think you have to be really honest with yourself and and look at your point of view and, and where you're coming from uh, so we have a couple more questions in the chat um we have a couple questions from marlena henry um they asked did your process as a director change at all working with non-professional actors Yes, <laughs> I realized that I could really trust my my actors and to really bring this sense of play that I didn't have before. Um, so it changed radically and also just the collaboration itself, you know, actors, whether they're trained or not, can bring you so much. It's all about creating this atmosphere of trust. So I, I learned that that was really important. I was wondering about a specific scene where he kicks the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful moment. You know, he 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 exuded a lot of um, angst naturally. Uh, Udad, uh, played by Ayub. Um, so yeah, there were moments where he was he was really pissed. He <laughs> it was hot. You know, we're we're in the desert. 10 minutes feels like three hours under the sun. So there were some tense moments and um, he was he was able to channel it in front of the camera. <laughs> it, it, it seems a bit spontaneous, <laughs> that outburst. <laughs> it, it totally was, you know. Um, there was another thing that he used to do, like he would like play with his jaw when he was really tired. And it was just really interesting. He was so unaware of it. Um, and in, in addition to that, we were filming during Ramadan, so, you know, no food, <laughs> no drink in that hot sun. It was it was a lot. Um, oh. So that that also brought this very slow, I think, paceness to to their movements. Um, so, you know, it kind of added to the ambiance. <laughs> Um, we have another question uh, from Marlena. She said, uh, I noticed that the two films of yours she's seen um, are in black and white. Is filming in black and white part of your style as an auteur or is it specific to each film's theme? Yeah, it's it's not part of my style as a, as a writer director, but I really look at what the story needs. And um, yeah, just what kind of sensibility I need to tell that story in the best way possible. Again, because this was originally a science fiction story um, inspired by science fiction, I really wanted to take away the colorfulness that Morocco has. So that's why I played with black and white and also deepen the mythology. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it just always depends on that story. Would you like to talk a little bit more about the equipment, the camera, and the use of it? Yeah, so this was extremely low budget. Um, we had two cameras. 
we had a Canon 5D and a Canon 7D. Um, most of the time they were rolling, you know, simultaneously, but it was just super low budget. And um, still we were able to use just natural lighting, mostly, you know, a few flags um, here and there, but we just played with, with the natural environment as much as we could. And it was, yeah, very, very cheap in the end. And small scale allowing you to be intimate with the more handheld, but also the breathing room, the film has so wonderfully in the balance with the still shots compared with the more neorealist handheld. Is that a fair way to put it? Or Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think because even the crew size was so small, I was able to spend so much time with the family, with with the two main actors and um, you know, I was filming the rehearsals. So some of the sh shots were rehearsals. We were just playing. So again, it would just took off the pressure, you know? Sometimes big cameras can feel intimidating, uh, especially with non-actors. So it was, it brought this playfulness that was really nice. Yeah. More questions, great. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. I appreciate you sharing it. Uh, I have a question and a comment. Before we saw a single image or heard any dialogue, this amazing wind came in even before the music. So I was wondering if you would talk about that as a choice for opening the film, because it, at least for me, it brought me immediately into the mythical uh, mm -hmm. realm. And then I, I know you've obviously chosen the best 10 minutes of your eight hours of footage, but I'm so curious about the other seven hours and 50 minutes and where they're going to live. <laughs> um, well, for the wind, so that is actually the desert wind and you really feel it as soon as, you know, the sun sets, it's very strong <laughs> and it gets very cold there. Um, so we were just playing with the landscape and you know, recording the the wind and, and the natural sound there. Um, in terms of the footage that didn't make the 10 minutes, you know, I don't know, maybe in some way, maybe it'll go into the feature length. I still haven't thought of that in, in more, you know, in depth, but um, it was, again, it, it was really hard to, to kind of leave out those moments, but I think that it will find a new life in some way. I believe there uh, may have been another hand. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. So I actually had a question. I was thinking about the medium of film and how it's dependent on light. And this was a film about darkness. And there was a couple moments where you were like really aware of like the light fading on the faces. And you're like, well, there's not going to be anything left to film there once the light goes away. So I was really thinking about that and how that, um, you know, contributes to the story. Um, and just wondering if that was something you were considering, like it's the relationship of light and the medium of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, sun, I, I was just telling Josh this um, a couple hours ago, sun always has a masculine energy, at least um, in a lot of mythology and a lot of religious contexts and spiritual contexts. And the moon always has a feminine energy. Um, so the only thing in color is the moon in the end when it rises. And we were not planning for that at all, you know? And that was literally on our last day of shooting where we saw the moon rising and it was this beautiful orange. Um, so it's deeply connected with, with the story and also with Afri and what Afri represents. So I was definitely playing with that, the masculine and, and feminine, how they play together. But again, I, I believe someone brought this up before, not the passive feminine, but a feeling of ominousness, of threat, possible danger as well. Yes, yeah. But also of, of a sense of safety and a sense of compassion that holds things together and you know, sustains what is. The sublime is something that can be uh, not frightening, but 
Overwhelming, maybe. Yes, overwhelming. Yes, 100%. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what other word to use, but definitely overwhelming. I sense a few others would like to speak. Thank you. Um, when the, or when she's out in the desert and she like has a moment, I, I would presume of like prayer or like connection with source or with whatever she's connecting to. I just like was really drawn to how she seemed to curl up um, instead of like some, like expand her energy. And I was wondering like what you were thinking about or how you made that decision in her like position and posture during that moment, or if that was something that she just naturally did and you played with. Yeah, that moment really, I wanted to evoke a moment of turning in and how that's when she really gets her power. And, you know, she also starts hearing the blessings of, of the other people, you know, praying. And, and that's when she really gets recharged. Um, so it's a private moment, you know, and it's a, it's a gentle moment. It's an intimate moment. And I think the best way to, to evoke that is by curling down and, you know, turning inward. That's a beautiful shot. Thank you. And the one of the billowing clothing as well speaking of the wind and it's not the feeling of figures in a landscape that are insignificant even though it's overwhelming and so much larger than them it's that intimacy of connectedness going right to the last shot in the credits where the moon isn't presented in that stately wide it's in fact shaky and intimate mm -hmm. and personal right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my over reading no, that's a that's a great reading of it. Um, yeah, I mean, we we again we hardly used any tripods except in maybe one or two moments. It was always handheld, and I wanted that vulnerability that the shaky camera, you know, the handheld effect has. Um, yeah, so it's all connected to Hanan and, and the sister and how she is emotionally. It brings us inside their imagination of the landscape. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Um, are there more questions from the webinar chat? I think you've answered if there, there was a couple more, but I think there are points you already covered. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. And thank you, Josh. Thank you, Sarah, for a wonderful film. Thank you all for coming.